Speak the words of God. And you see the needs that's here in every heart. Here and in the house in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture we're reading this morning is Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. Revelation 11, 11 through 14. And here we go. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour were there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, I had some introductory remarks here, but I'm going to put them on tape in the interest of time and also so you'll have them that you can reflect on them. First of all, we're going to be pressing forward in Christ. I, it's so wonderful. I think this is a day to press forward in the Lord. Amen. It's a time to press forward. And I went to the Lord recently to hear his voice. And this is what the Lord said. It sounds a little harsh, but this is what he said. I will tell you what I heard. And the prophets judge. The prophets judge. He said, it is time to take the kingdom. And the, and it is time to press forward and take the kingdom, and those who do not will be shoved aside. Well, that sounds harsh, but that's what I got. Let the prophets judge. I'm not going to change what the Lord gives me. That's what I got. And so anyway, now we realize that when people are changing from sheep to soldiers, God, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Amen. How many have found it so? The struggle, because we're not used to it, and things are different, but we're moving ahead. We're moving ahead. Now, the council, the church council of this church is committed to helping everyone we can. We don't want anyone to be shoved aside. But in other words, there's something you're going to have to do with your will. You're going to have to choose to move forward with God. Amen? Amen? But we're going to do what we can help. And our council of six men and myself are committed. We're formally committed to help people as much as we can. Now, these are the provisions that we have as a church for those who are struggling to keep up with the message. First of all, Audrey and I are available. Now, those of you that have called us for counseling, you know that. And uh, we always respond with time at our home within a week. I don't think we've ever put it off anybody. Usually it's within a couple of days. And we take the time. If it takes two or three hours, that's the time we take. And those who were in our house last week know that that's the truth. We don't hurry anybody. We take the time. And uh, if it's an emergency, whether it's in the morning or the middle of the day or at night, it's instantly. So you have that resource. And then, I, and then another resource that we have for those who are struggling, uh, now, for example, uh, people have needs. When there are financial problems or health problems, people in the hospital or it's general problems, we have two visitation couples now. And so yeah, for those who are relatively new, if Bill and Rosemary would stand, is Rosemary here this morning? Bill and Rosie, and also Kathy and Bill Ott, if you would stand, Kathy. And Bill is on the reserves. He's in the military reserve this week. And so these two families, Bill and Kathy, thank you, Kathy, and Bill and Rosemary Campillo are available. Call them, tell them someone needs a visitation in the hospital, whatever. That, that is their ministry. And, they, and these two families speak with the voice of the church. 
That is what they say is, a, is the same as the church speaking. Now, uh, Audrey and I bo know both these families well. They report back to us so that we can put in our input and so there's no confusion. We know exactly what's going on. We know how to pray and we can work. So these two families, I hope that you will uh, let them know because I know what my ministry is. God has called me to prayer and the ministry of the word. And I'm ready to reach out and help anybody and pull them along the best I can. You may be interested, uh, some that are newer in the church may be interested to realize, to comprehend that most of our congregation is not here. I mean, this probably represents one-fifth of the people that, we, uh, that actually are ministered to by this church in tapes, radio, and books. I think it would be conservative to say that this church represents about one-fifth. That's probably conservative. We're growing in our tape ministry about one a week. It's like one new person being added to the church a week. That's not counting the radio. That's not counting the books. So it is increasing, and that may help you to realize our ministry here as a church is an outreach uh, in the kingdom message, the message of the gospel. Notwithstanding, we don't want to neglect the people that are here. We don't want to neglect the people that are here. And so we have, uh, Audrey and I take the time, anytime. Uh, Bill and Rosie and uh, uh, Bill Ott and, and uh, Kathy Ott are officially speak with the voice of the church in when people are having personal needs. And then uh, we discussed at the last council meeting another help. Now, Stan, if you'll stand, Please stand. Most everybody knows Stan, but just in case there may be some who don't. Now, Stan, within this last week, received his ministerial license. Now, that gives him full ministerial privileges, including marrying. So I'm, I refer to him now as marrying Stan. Uh, so if you want to get married, you're looking at marrying Stan. Thank you, Stan. You may be seated. Yeah, he didn't know I was going to say that, but that's all right. He'll, he'll survive. So I'll have to loan him my book, I guess. But uh, he, ha he has evinced uh, on a couple of occasions a real concern. So if you uh, are having problems with the doctrine or there's something you don't understand or you need prayer or help, we've discussed the possibility of having maybe a special meeting during the week uh, in which Stan would officiate and you could it'd be like a small church meeting where you could get a chance to say that what the needs are, express your misgivings, and so on. Uh, so if this is of interest to you, please let Stan know that there is an interest here. There's one, two, or three people will set up something on a regular basis so that you can have a chance to talk to a minister of the church about the needs of the Christian life. Now, Stan has been with us, how many years, Stan? 11 years, plus having the blessing of the Foursquare. He's a Foursquare, four licensed Foursquare minister. And so he, uh, so he has the blessing of the church. And again, Stan is faithful to report back so that we know, Audrey and I know how to pray and what we're doing. So again, we have a desire. When I look to the Lord, the Lord is saying, press on, build, don't let anything stop you. Build, build, press forward. Hallelujah. Do you have a heart to press forward? Amen. What? Amen. Amen. Glory. Well, that's what we're fixing to do, and we'll bring just as many with us. That's what we're devoted to do, giving up our life, our professional life to do to help as many as we can enter the kingdom of God. Someone expressed the difference in uh, the gospel of the kingdom and the traditional message the other day. It was so clear and so simple that uh, the gospel of the kingdom is different in the, from the traditional message in this. This is one simple way to express it. In the Advanced Magazine, the Foursquare Magazine that Mary uh, spoke about, Mary Doan just spoke about, on one of the pages that portrays missionaries going to a village and they're saying to the villagers, 
you're old and you're going to die anyway, why don't you receive Jesus so you can go to heaven? That, I don't know if you saw that, Mary, but that's in that magazine. You may have, may have seen that as you're reading it through. And I, I saw that and I was pondering on that and I'm trying to grasp the immensity of what God is doing. And, uh, and then this lady uh, spoke the other night uh, to Audrey and me and she said she'd been traveling to many places there, so very few that preach the kingdom. And she said the difference is that the kingdom message talks about building character. And I was so simply put, so simply put. And I thought, well, you won't find anywhere in the book of Acts, anywhere where missionaries came and said, accept Jesus so you can go to heaven. You know, they talked about, they didn't even talk about going to heaven at all. They were t speaking as though the Lord was coming within a week. God was going to judge the world by that man. Repent and preach the gospel. Read the book of Acts. It would be a shocker to you. They never talked about going to heaven. They talked about the day of judgment. But then when you get into the New Testament epistles, what it talks about is character. Character. And that message, see, that's been not, maybe not emphasized the way it should have been. And that's where people, you know, they come into a, a kingdom preaching church. And they say, well, you know, what is this? How come they're not talking about the rapture and going to heaven? They're talking about uh, mortifying the flesh. They're talking about offering your body a living sacrifice. They're talking about taking up your cross. I don't understand this. This is a hard word. What in the world? And that's what the New Testament talks about. It doesn't talk about dying and going to heaven. It talks about character. It talks about you. You know, if you want to sum it up, the reason we accept Jesus is to please God, to make ourselves pleasing to God so that he will hear us and so that we will do us not to go to heaven. See, it's not self-centered. The gospel is not self-centered. It's not receive this so you'll get good stuff. It's receive this so that God may be pleased. How many see that? That's not complicated. Well, it's hard only if you're used to not having the character approach. If what you're hearing is how wonderful it will be for you, and I'll tell you, I heard a shocker. We were over at Bob and Margaret's the other night, and we heard a videotape of Earl Clampett's by a man from New Zealand, Frank, Gary Smith. Barry, Barry. Barry Smith. Frank says, forget him. Well, I, I, all right, I'll forget him. But, I, but he told something, and I don't know, I, Frank wouldn't object to this, I'm sure. Now, this is down, right down Frank's alley. But this is what he said on this video, and maybe if you chomp on Earl a little, he'll let you borrow it and look at it. It's, it I think it's worth seeing, albeit Frank disclaims any citizenship for him. All right, now, he said that there was, uh, and I'm just repeating what he said, I don't know this for a fact, I never preach against masonry or anything, but he said at the highest order of masonry, uh, according to a scholar's book, do you remember the scholar's name? I've heard it before. I've heard it before. It's current. But this scholar, Bob, you remember it? Yeah. I, well, he, anyway, he said that at the highest order, they teach that Lucifer is God. Well, that seems to us incredible. But this guy is from New Zealand. How could he be wrong? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you can get it from Earl. You can judge for yourself. I mean, he was quoting facts and figures. I mean, this is incredible. But this is the reason, people, hey, tune in. This is the reason. They said that this God, this God, Adonai, Adonai of the Jews is so hard. And, and, and it was the idea of this. I don't know. He's got all these rules and nobody can have he, He's just one half of God. Right, Earl? The other half of God is Lucifer, and that's the part of God where you enjoy yourself. Boy, I'm telling you, something snapped in my spirit. And I said, Boy, I went on to talk to the Lord after that. I said, Lord, I am choosing you. I am choosing Adonai of the Hebrews 
with all his rules and his strictness, and I don't even want to hear about Lucifer. But something went off in my brain. I thought, where does all this teaching come from that you can serve Jesus, who is the God of the Hebrews? Hallelujah. I'm getting all fired up about the kingdom. I'm a kingdom preacher, and guess who the gospel of the kingdom is to first? Maybe they'll hear. Albert, maybe they'll hear. Huh? The gospel is first. To the Jews, the gospel of the kingdom, mind you. To that Adonai of the Yehudi, uh, Adonai is a straight God. He's the God of the Hebrews, but he is also the God of the Christians. And this Luciferian idea that there's a side of God in which we can relax and kick back and have parties. Hey, I'll tell you what God is being worshipped, and it isn't Adonai. Something to think about. So as we read the New Testament, if we want to stay with the New Testament, what the New Testament talks about is serving this Lord of the Hebrews. Jesus said before Abraham, I am. And the God of the covenant name of the Hebrews that they never pronounce, Yahweh of the Hebrews, uh, the sacred name, uh, which is yod Hey vav Hey, just four consonants that King James transliterates Jehovah. That God is Yeshua. Jesus. Yeshua is the I am of the Hebrews. Hallelujah. Jesus wasn't born in New York. Or London. Yeah, or any place else. But Beit Lechem, the house of bread. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethlehem of Judea. According to the prophet. Thou, Bethlehem, though thou be least among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth he that is to be ruler in Israel. It's a Jewish salvation, people. It's not Gentile. And there's no such thing as a Gentile church. Get out of your vocabulary. It isn't in the Bible. There is only... As Paul said in Ephesians, the, uh, the third chapter, in the first four or five verses, one church, one body, one baptism, one spirit. And in Romans 11, one olive tree. Hallelujah. And in Ephesians, the second chapter, we've been brought into the commonwealth of Israel, built upon the uh, foundation of the apostles and prophets. Shlichim is apostles in Hebrew, built on that foundation. And the first body of the Messiah was all Yahudim, all Jews, and you are and I are in by the grace of God. Amen. I love this Adonai of the Hebrews. He is my God, strict as he is and stern as he is. I don't say to him, Av, Father, I say to him, Abba, Daddy. His spirit in my heart says, Abba. That's not father in Hebrew. That's dad. Father in Hebrew is Ab. Abba. Abba. Papa. Daddy. Dad. Affection. Elohim. That he is God. In this other stuff we're hearing, that you can be a Christian and have a ball is loose. And if you want it, you can have my part. I don't want anything to do with him. Just Adonai. Stern, yes. But with a love we'll never understand. But it's not human love and it's not sentiment. And this God says... 
It's time to take the kingdom. And he can do no more than take upon himself the penalty for our sins and die on our place. What more can God do to show his love? And he has given us the ministry. He's given us the body and blood of Jesus. He's given us the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. He's given us everything. And he says, come on, come on. Hallelujah. If you don't give, use your talent, it'll be given to somebody else. Is that what he said? I don't know. Is that what he said, people? So we need to remember the goodness and the severity of God. So we have in this church made these provisions, and it's on tape in case you wish to review it, so that no one need remain in the valley of decision or be without help or a kind word. No one need to be without help or a kind word. And in the meanwhile, we as a church are going to press forward in Jesus. Hallelujah. And I've heard so many good reports this week. It's no wonder I'm on cloud nine from within the church and from outside the church. And uh, hallelujah, we're going to press forward. And that's what God is saying. Build, press forward, go forward in the Lord. And we, as I say, just remember, you're sitting in about one twentieth of the church. About one fifth of it, this church. Hallelujah. All right, so provision for everyone, but it's going to have to be within your will to say, Lord, this is what I choose. It's their help is there in the church. This is what I choose, to go on with Jesus. Are you game to go on? Amen. Hallelujah. Because it's time to take the kingdom. And this is a forward-looking, kingdom-preaching church that's affecting many people. All right, now in Revelation chapter 11, we talked, and if you weren't here Tuesday night, hey, <laughs> if you weren't here Tuesday night, you better talk to somebody that was and let a little of it rub off on you. All right, now, uh, there was praise here, and there was worship. And God was portraying to us the reality of the resurrection. And in verse uh, chat, Revelation 11 and 11, it's describing the resurrection from the dead of the first fruits, the witnesses of God of every age. And this is an amplification of 1 Thessalonians 4, which gives us a few brief things. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's emphasizing comfort to those who have deceased relatives. And they were afraid in 1 Thessalonians 4, they were afraid that the kingdom would come and their relatives wouldn't be there. That's what it's about. The so-called rapture passage is actually a funeral sermon. But now, uh, in, in the light of the kingdom, as at 1 Thessalonians 4 is the light of the kingdom. The kingdom is coming. Where will they be? Paul says, they're going to be with you. They're going to be with you. We enter in the kingdom together. Now, 11.11 11 of Revelation is amplifying this, showing us that they don't become invisible but rather that it is the greatest testimony the world has ever seen. And we went into Isaiah chapter 60 to, sh to give another amplification of this. That's on last Tuesday night's tape. That would be what, October? Today's October uh, 20, so it would be last Tuesday from October 20. All right, now they stood upon their feet. We talked about that. And by the way, Barry Smith talked about that uh, in Dutch. In Dutch, he said, it's upstan, upstan. They stood up on their feet is the word for resurrection. All right, now, great fear fell upon them which saw them because these witnesses in their life had been a torment. Whether you're talking about Elijah, no, or whoever, in their life they had been a torment. Even up to our day, true witnesses are always a torment to the flesh. True witnesses are always a torment to people, Christians or non-Christians, who are trying to have their cake and eat it too, and a true witness of God. And by the way, when you go on your job or out in the world to witness, we've had, I think, a somewhat limited understanding of what it means to be witnessing. Do you know how you witness on your job? 
You behave yourself as a Christian. That's all you need to do. You don't have to preach. Preaching is the business of the evangelist. You don't have to preach to people. People in this country have been preached to, preached to, preached to, preached to, preached to till they're cynical. But bearing witness is when you go on the job and you work hard and study to be quiet, maybe in your lunch hour you're reading your Bible. You're not doing it to show off. You're just being what you are. You don't curse. You don't become angry. You don't criticize your fellow employees. You don't criticize the boss. You're just a good employee and a good, decent person. People, that's the witness. And then if somebody asks you and they say, well, how come you didn't curse? Everybody else around here is cursing. How come? Then, with meekness and fear, you give an answer for the reason that is in you. That's what people say. Mary, I didn't know you were here this morning. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, welcome back. Okay, you're looking good. All right, how many see that? How many see what I'm saying? You have to preach to people and say you ought to accept Christ. Just be it. That's all that God is saying. If somebody asks you, the Bible says, if somebody asks you, it doesn't say volunteer. If somebody asks you for a reason of the hope, that, but I'm supposed to witness, I'm supposed to preach. No. No. Just live it. People are waiting to see the gospel in shoe leather. That's you. We get people that preach and tell you to accept Christ and then they swear and drink and do drugs. That's worse than nothing. Just live it. You have to say a word. Let the preachers preach, okay? There is a gift of evangelism. Just live it. That's the witness. The rest is ministry, okay? And so the main thing is the witness. So the witnesses of all ages have been a torment to people. You know, people see they're not joining our party. And I've had a, a number of people in this church say it's getting very difficult to work out on the job because the unsaved are being mean. A number of people here have told me that. The, un, the unsaved are being mean. And they're being mean because their spirit recognizes your spirit is hostile and it's a torment to them. You don't have to say anything. Just do your job. Work and be quiet. Give the boss a dollar's value for a dollar pay. It's up to you. And people around you who are not Christians will feel that thing. And in the days to come, they'll do more than that because they'll sense that you're a Christian. So be a Christian all the way so that you have the protection of the Lord. All right, now, they stood up on their feet. The greatest witness that the world has ever seen. And again, it will be a torment to the wicked. The Christian witness is never a torment to the meek and the godly. And that's why in Isaiah 60, when the light comes on the witnesses, people come from all over the world because the meek inherit the earth. They love it. It's the wicked that hate the witness. The witnesses do not torment the righteous or the meek. They torment the wicked. Just as Jesus was a torment to the high priests and elders of Israel because they were wicked. And so there will be a tremendous testimony and fear on the part of the wicked who see them. Then it says, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. Now, I've said many times when you see heaven, it's uranos in the Greek. You can't tell whether it means the spirit heaven where the Father is or the heaven immediately above us. They're not two different words. It's the same thing in the Hebrew and in the Greek. So you have to kind of go by other scriptures. And we know in Acts uh, 1, I believe it is. I believe it's Acts 1. Where it says, and this same Jesus, which you saw ascend into heaven, shall come in like manner. Well, they didn't see him go into the spirit heaven. They saw him enter the cloud. So let's not be too quick to picture these ascending up to the spirit heaven. The people saw them ascend. Now in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
It says we caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds. Okay? Well, it's taught all the time that they go up then to heaven and live in mansions. It doesn't say anything about mansions. It doesn't say anything about the spirit heaven. It talks about clouds, and clouds are not high up. So we're not talking about them being caught way away somewhere. Just, they just ascend from the earth to meet the Lord. They ascend up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, their enemies. We don't like to talk about enemies. We don't like to talk about enemies. It's not a, a positive, upbeat topic. But do you know that God uses your enemies? Now, I tell you, if you want a table prepared for you, <laughs> there's another ingredient that you need. Enemies. Because that's where God prepares your table. Huh? You want to roll? Well, I'm going to tell you where you're going to rule in the midst of. Your enemies. Now, I'm not going to belabor that this morning, but somebody will pick up that little nugget. There's an awful lot there. It has to do with the nature of the kingdom. And as we grow in the Lord, and we're making provision for people that are, that are coming in, need to hear the doctrine, need to be comforted, need encouragement. And that's, that's right. For those who are going on and pressing on, as you begin to put on some muscle tone, and you begin to grow in understanding, you will find that you are coming into a kingdom which is not a Sunday school kingdom. It is not a nice church kingdom. But it comprises all kinds of spirits, human and non-human, who are seeking their own way. And in the midst of this, the Lord says to Yeshua, HaMashiach, the anointed of God, rule thou! In the midst of thine enemies. And again in the 23rd Psalm, the Almighty God, El Elyon Elohim, says to Halagos, the word, Yeshua HaMashiach, says to him, I will set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Because every psalm is written to Jesus first. And then to us who are the little ones, his little brothers. And God has conformed us, is conforming us to his image. And as we begin to grow in the presence of our great elder brother. Aren't you glad Jesus is your elder brother? Hallelujah. I wouldn't want to stand before the almighty God without my elder brother. And as our elder brother makes a way for us and teaches us and instructs the holy angels of God to help us, and we're little ones coming up, at appropriate time, he says to us, rule thou. And we say, oh, man. I mean, I want to be surrounded with friends. We're coming up. And the reason is because of the rebellion in heaven. And God is raising up sons who will rule in his presence with a rod of iron. Think of it. Think of it. Why a rod of iron? Of all the things for a loving God to say to his fervent saints who love everybody. And what does he say to them? I mean, this loving God who gave his life on the cross and who loves with a love we can't even comprehend. He said, thou shalt dash them in pieces. The kingdom, people. The kingdom. We're not talking about dying, going to heaven. We're talking about the movement of those who sit on the thrones of power from cherubim to the holy ones of the Lord. That's what the Bible's about. 
The Ten Commandments were written to man, but before that they were written to Satan. God has been speaking out of the darkness, and these rebels have been wondering, what is going to happen to us? God doesn't show his hand, but he lets it leak out through the church that now unto the angels and principalities and heavenly places might be made known through the church, the manifold wisdom of God. They don't know what's going to happen to them. It's going to come forth through the church. My God shall crush Satan under your feet shortly, and he's trembling. Amen. He's seducing you if he can. Keeping you immature if he can. Because he knows when those sons finally grow up and get some muscle tone and get some biceps and triceps and strengthen their legs and they begin to grow up before the almighty God under the hand of their elder brother. He knows what they're going to do. They're going to rule toy in the midst of their enemies. Hallelujah. And divine order will be established in the heavens and upon the earth, people. That's the kingdom. It's not a shoe in. Rule thou, Earl, in the midst of thine enemies. I don't want to rule in the midst of my enemies. I want friends around here. What a thing. Set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I get indigestion. <laughs> How can I enjoy my falafel in the presence of my enemies? Give me a bellyache. He set a table before me. And they're all standing around looking at me. <laughs> all of them gnashing, sneering. We'll get him. Sneering. I'm sitting there eating my cereal. Oh, hallelujah. I want to sing and dance in the heights of Zion. Huh? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I hear glory, glory, glory. Oh, glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah. I'm saved and I'm so glad I am. Hallelujah. Another bite of cereal and brownies. Oh, hallelujah. Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. I tell you, when there's a knife at your throat, it keeps you from talking foolishness. Oh, I mean, that's all free. And so these witnesses come up and their enemies look at them in fear and hatred and torment. Oh, this is the last thing. We had one world. We had it going. We had a UN. We had, we were now, we're paying our taxes to the UN. The UN has the law, the courts, everything, the money, the world bank. They had it all made. And all of us left was those worshipers of Adonah. Adonah. God, the Jews, the Jews. Brother, sister, I'd rather be a Jew than anything I know. <laughs> because of them is the fathers and the prophets. What have I got from England, Ireland, and Scotland? Druids. Celtish rites, they're horrible. Too bad for me to pronounce in church. I want to be in the tame olive tree, the cultivated olive tree. Man, I came out of phrenology and all this other stuff. My grandparents, probably a whole bunch of liars, thieves, and murderers in my background, and come out and... I want to be a Jew. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where, you know, you want to learn Hebrew. That's the language of the future, people. They saw them standing on their feet. God's witnesses from every age. There goes our one world. Surely get our sorcerers together. Get all our seducers. Where's Satan? Call it. Where's our Lucifer, our king? One angel comes down and takes care of their king. They're facing unlimited power and the wrath of an angry lamb, which is the most incongruous sight in the world, an angry lamb. Some of us are lambs. We need to become sheep, and the sheep need to become soldiers. And then we have to become a lamb again. An angry lamb. Hide us. From the face, let the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb. One world, that's the end of the one world. And all the rest of it, the conspiracy. That's a foot. 
And the same hour was there a great earthquake in the tenth part of the city. Notice the definite article, the. Not the cities, but the city. And we are moving, we are moving, I believe, toward one city. I don't know where it'll be located. But it's foolish to worry about cities or anything else when with the speed of light and computers you can transfer data instantly. So geographical location, uh, thanks to the computer, will cease to have any validity at all because everything will be done with the speed of light and we'll have one city. Maybe that's part of the meaning. And the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. Whether this is literal or figurative, I do not know. Uh, Revelation moves between the two, the literal and the figurative. And gave glory, the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, God will hear that. God will hear that, people. No matter how wicked men become, if God strikes and they repent, our God will hear them. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning, you've committed heinous sins. Let me tell you something. This morning, you can walk out of here whiter than the snow. I don't say that you will not reap what you have sown. God does not say that. But as far as God is concerned, you are clean because of Jesus. And that's the provision that he's made. And it's legal and it'll stand in the court of heaven. When men change, sometimes in the church we get too self-righteous. And we figure, oh, look at that. There's homosexuals out there. And now look what they're doing. And oh, there's these druggies. And there's that and the other. Listen, all they have to do is say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Tuh. And then we get mad, you know, like the guy say, I've labored all day. I've been out here in the vineyard all day. And, and I've worked for a penny. And this guy comes in at the 11th hour, he gets a penny. And the boss says, yeah, this has nothing to do with you. I told you what I would do for you. Let's watch that. I, because I believe God wants the homosexuals to turn to him. I believe God wants the lesbians to turn to him, the prostitutes and all the rest. And the moment he does, we don't say, yeah, you know, they're bringing in the riffraff off the street. You know what they were. God doesn't do that. The angels sing, the bells of heaven ring because a sinner has to go home. You know, there's a verse that goes through my mind. How about you? And it says, uh, it, Oh God, if you would mark iniquity, who would stand? You? Not me. Oh God, if you would mark iniquity, who would stand? And so while we're criticizing other people, let's remember that God has forgiven us. So let's be generous with people that are struggling, that are out in the street and not be caught uh, cursing the abortionists and cursing all these people. No, we don't agree with them. But some of them will come to Jesus and they'll be forgiven. And then they have a nightmare after that. God, I murdered somebody. See, what you reap, what you sow, you reap. God forgives you. He doesn't put you on probation, summary probation or any other kind. God doesn't put you on probation. He forgives you. He says, welcome home. But then you've got to spin out the consequences of your life, and God will help you. He will help you. Praise the Lord. That's the way he works. He throws his cloak over you, and then you have to work it out. All right? The remnant and gave glory to the God of heaven. That's a wonderful thing. And that happens to us sometimes. Sometimes we have to get hit awfully hard before we give glory to God. You ever notice that? We go along in our rebellion, our perversity, our stubbornness, and our lust. And people are praying for us. And then God, whack, and there's an earthquake <laughs> in our life. And then we give glory to God. My motto is, give glory to God first. <laughs> I tell you, I, I like the easy way myself. All right. The second woe is past. You know, why is the by revelation a book of woe? Why is it a book of woes? All us happy Christians. It's because man rebelled against God. People, we're not in heaven. We're not in paradise. We're, we're in a cursed earth. We're in a cursed earth, people. And things are bad news everywhere you turn. 
You know, we think about the old days. We think about grandma and grandpa down on the farm and the chickens and the lambs. It was just as worse then. Grandpa was on booze half the time. I'm not talking about your grandpa. I'm talking about the, quote, good old days. They never were. Always because it's a cursed world and the demon has constantly sought to move in. And so they had their problems. You went to Thanksgiving time and grandma made cookies, but a week after Thanksgiving, you weren't there to, well, anyway. There never were good old days. There's only today, and it's whatever we make of it. And if we want to serve God, we can have a happy home. Sure, there's going to be battles, but we can make it. We can make it. We can make it if that's what we want to do. There'll be a struggle. All life is a struggle. How many know that the unsaved struggle? How many know the lukewarm Christian struggle? How many know the wicked struggle? How many know the righteous struggle? Everybody struggles. But this is the best way. And we have help from Jesus to make it work. And every life, growth is always painful in nature. It's always a mitosis is occurring, a splitting and a rending. That's the way growth is. So let's be people, be strong in the Lord our God. Take, take it on the chin when, when we've got it coming. And press on with the Lord. He's good. This God of the Hebrews is good. And Lucifer is a liar. Man, he can't do anything right. This, I never did find the third woe. Bill Campillo has an electronic Bible. He may be able to find that third woe. But I think it was in the book that was written after Revelation. And the seventh angel sounded. This is the last angel. And this marks the conclusion of this age. And I used to say the conclusion of the church age. But in a very real way. And this is for the advanced scholars now. The next thousand year period in some respects is a continuation of the present age. The conclusion of life as we know it does not come when the Lord returns, but rather at the end of the thousand-year period. And there's little indications of this in the Bible. Now, I know some of you are not following me, but some of the scholars will, and the teaching elders will follow me. See, Jesus, see the coming of the Lord, this next coming of the Lord is not the end of the world. Rather, it is the gathering to the Lord of a first fruits of his bride for the sake of making change in the world and perfecting the remainder of his bride. And Jesus gives us a clue to this when he says that he would walk the first day and the second day and the third day he would be perfected. And he was quoting from Hosea. The sixth chapter about the third verse that says, after two days will he revive us and the third day we shall live in his sight. So you'll notice in reading in the, in the uh, two epistles of Peter, it seems that Peter did not, was not even aware of the thousand year period. And so the thousand year period, and it's possible that Paul was not aware of it. It's a revelation given nowhere except in the book of Revelation. This thousand year period is a special time. And so the book of Revelation is telling us that before the historic coming of the Lord, there will be a first phase in which the royal priesthood will be given glorified bodies. And if you look at it that way, it will make a lot of the scriptures make sense. The scripture would count the coming of the Lord at the beginning and the end of the millennium as one coming. As one coming. But it's separated from our standpoint in the resurrection of the first fruits. And there is a lot of scripture to back this up. And you can find it in my booklet called The Tabernacle of David. It goes into the meaning of the tabernacle of David, why it was removed from the ark, 
why it remains separate from the ark until the building of the Temple of Solomon. And if you read my booklet, The Tabernacle of David, it explains some of the scripture background for this teaching. That when the Lord comes, it is for a first fruits of his bride. Not, not some, you know, like everybody in this church. We're the special ones and nobody else. I'm not talking about that at all. Out of the church now, worldwide, God is calling out a holy remnant. And anybody that will look at the church can see it just as plain as can be. You'll find that most Christians don't even know when you're talking about, and when you mention suffering, they'll say, my God would never let me suffer. And the chances are they're so deep in suffering in their life that they can hardly take it and are about ready to be institutionalized. But with their dying gas, they'll say, my God would never let me suffer. That's what theology will do for you. It'll make you schizophrenic. Is, that, is your is theology doing that for you? No, nobody says, all right, so we'll go on. So I'm not saying that this church is some super hoity-toity bunch of super spiritual people. I'm not teaching that. I'm teaching that the, the types of the scripture show that God is going to call out from his church a first fruits and that he is doing it now. And if you'll open up your eyes and look around, you can see it. And they all, they all say that, see, we got a lot of correspondence and they all say the same thing. God's been telling me that for years and I've never heard anybody say it. Yeah, some people have moved across the country and have left promising situations to come to this church because of the word. And there are other people. I'm not the only one. I'm not saying, even intimating that in any manner, shape, or form. That would make this a cult. Somebody said, if you can, I don't even, I'm not even going to repeat it. It isn't even worth repeating. No, I, I know there are people, God has people in every church. And you know from what I've said many, many times that I am the last person in the world, last person in the world to point to this church and say, this is the only place, and if you're not here, you know, you're done in. Anybody ever heard me say that? I've had good fr friends here from the church that have told people that left your backslid. But what I usually say, and I've said many times, and as recently as I think three weeks ago, that God works outside this church and if you leave, my blessing is with you. I don't even invite people to church. Amen. 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 I love to have you come. And I love to see your smiling face. And I love to see you becoming men of war. I love to see it. It makes it all worthwhile. It makes it all worthwhile to me to sit at the church and see you praising the Lord. Like last Tuesday night, was, it was exceptionally good. I mean, this makes the whole thing worthwhile. I go home floating above the earth. Praise the Lord. That's what makes it worthwhile, to see people entering in victoriously, getting the victory, serving the Lord. But I know God is working in other places, and I know that there's good men and women preaching the gospel all over the place. That's not what I'm talking about, this church. I'm saying that in the day in which we live, God is speaking to people to move past Pentecost to the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a holy remnant that God is calling out from his church at this time. And the Lord is coming to receive that holy bridegroom. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such. The second death has no power, authority. Literally, Paul was seeking to attain the exonosis, the out-resurrection from the dead. The thousand-year period is a parenthesis in there in which the Lord himself becomes perfect. After two days, will he, uh, he revive us. I will walk the first day and cast out devils and do cures. And the third day, I, I, I will be perfected. I, Jesus, God, Mashiach, the anointed, Yeshua, will be perfected on the third day. Since we already know Jesus is perfect, that tells me that it's talking about the perfecting of his body. Does that make sense to you? Hallelujah. Glory to think that we should be alive in such a day. Oh, hallelujah. And the seals are coming off the book, people. They're for the musician. Now there's a chorus we need bad. The seals are coming off the book. Hallelujah, the seals are coming off the book. Hallelujah, the seals are coming off the book. And God is showing his hand and his power. Blessed be his name. All right, so there's woe. The reason for the woe is because we are on a cursed earth. There's no way we're going to make it different. This is no time to eat, drink, marry, 
uh, because tomorrow we die, this is a time when God is creating sons to put his universe in order under the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. And that's why we're being made in his image, and that's why his spirit is in us, so we can rule in the midst of our enemies. Hallelujah. And when God brings forth his sons, hallelujah, and they trample the wicked under feet, the devil is cast into the pit. Uh, the nations, their will is broken so that they have to serve God, will begin to see some of this peace and joy and happiness that we're hoping to see. It comes. There is no peace to the wicked, so there's going to be no peace, no joy to us until God begins to remove the wicked to the earth. So since that is the calling of God that is on us, then let us quit ourselves like people, like men of war, like women of war, like children of war. Let us quit ourselves because this is the only route in the universe to the peace and joy and glory that we're seeking. Does that make sense to you? Amen. Hallelujah. That's all there is. No big mystery. We have, we're, in, we're in boot camp. I remember, boot, how many went to boot camp? Let me see your hands. Oh, we've got a few booters here. All right, I don't see any ladies. Any ladies go to boot camp? I went to the Marine Well, they have, they don't laugh. They have a boot camp for ladies. They surely do. All right. Now, the boot camp that I went to, I had a friend tell me, at the same time I went and he went in the Army, and when he got through boot camp, he said, he said, I nearly died. I don't know what happened to you because I, I had to go in the Marine Corps. I passed the post office one day, and there was a beautiful blue uniform with a white hat and red stripes, and, I, and he had a gun. I, a gun lover, I said, that's for me, 17 years old. I owe my poor mother. <sighs> Mom, I enlisted. <laughs> oh, brother, in the middle of World War II. Well, in those days, somehow they hadn't got all educated to the right ways of doing things. And down I went to Paris Island, boot camp, 17 years old. Oh, brother. I got off the train in South Carolina in the middle of the night, covered, it was raining. And I was covered with soot because somebody forgot to close the windows in the train. Everybody was covered with soot and it rained on it. And there, you can imagine that. It was a wonderful introduction. And we went through a line, and there was some official there. I suppose it was a drill instructor. Somebody had a bunch of, of, of uh, ponchos. I've never had a poncho on in my life. A poncho is a flat piece of rubber with buttons rounding up. And, down. and it's worse than a hospital gown to try to figure out. It's, you know, it, it would take a man in broad daylight having eaten and slept well to sit down, feeling very patient, to figure out how in the world you put on a poncho. It's a flat piece of rubber with a hole in the middle and buttons up each side. You don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I'd never seen one. I never had one on. This is the middle of the night. I'm a fastidious person. I'm covered with soot, wringing wet. And this man didn't hand it to me and say, now, friend, uh, this is the way you do with a poncho and hold it out and I say now you slip this part over your head and then you button this side and then there see now isn't that nice welcome to the United States Marine Corps he didn't do that as I went by he took and flipped it at me with about 10 unprintable words <laughs> and I'm filthy dirty wet in the dark, wondering, what am I doing here? <laughs> Maybe mother was right. <laughs> but mothers are always right. But I had, at that point, I had no way of doing anything about it. I didn't have the money back home. They had guards there with guns. You, in Paris Island, South Carolina, you go across a bridge, so I was cut off from civilization. They said in the moat that surrounded the thing, there was crocodiles or alligators or something, so I had no way of changing my mind. I say, hey, you know, this, I'm really 15, you know. <laughs> that was boot camp. Well... I hope you don't go through anything like that. I think nowadays it's the, the humanistic influence has probably spread into the Marine Corps. I don't know. 
I don't know. They told us, you march or we'll march you into the swamps and, and, and boots die in there every week from the alligators. So uh, I don't know what they say that now. But uh, we're going through boot camp, people. We were lambs. And then we became sheep. And now we're becoming soldiers. Amen? And people don't stand around. We're trying to get people who will stand around and hold the poncho and show you where the buttons are. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> okay? But they'll, sure as God made apples, there'll come a time when you'll say, how in the world did I ever end up here? What are they talking about and what are they doing? And it's the middle of the night and I'm filthy dirty and I'm tired and I'm scared. Listen, God has never changed. He's still your God. He still loves you. He died on the cross for you. He's told us that in the end time, he was going to raise up an army. How many know that? How many know the difference between seeing sheep on parade and an army on parade. Are there any differences that you can think of offhand? Well, now you've all been to a parade. They're having one up in Escondido today, I think. They're having something up there. Well, now if you saw a parade of sheep and a parade of soldiers after them have been carefully trained, would you notice any difference? I think God's gonna make a difference in this church. Amen? So people know, hey, the sheep went by, and the sheep went by, and the lambs went by. Well, what's this coming down? Everyone in step, their buttons polished, their weapons over their shoulder, every eye straight forward, every stomach in and chest out, and all in rhythm, moving. It is the army of God. Hallelujah. Shall we stand? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.